I need you. Come and fill our hearts to overflowing. A fresh anointing this morning. A fresh infilling to your church. Lord, may your name be lifted up in our midst. May that which comes forth this morning come from our hearts. Hearts filled with gratitude. Hearts filled with thanksgiving for who you are and what you've done. Thank you, Lord. Let it rise. Let our praise arise. Let the praises of God arise in our midst. We come before you. We stand complete in you. You are the Holy One. You are the Righteous One. You dwell in us. And we dwell in you. We give you praise. We give you praise. Come, Holy Spirit. Be welcome in our midst. Come. Come. Oh, blessed one. We want to see you this morning. We want to see you, catch a glimpse of you. You who are seated at the right hand of the Father. Holy Spirit, reveal Jesus. And be free in our midst and in this place, in our lives. For Lord, we belong to you. And you have it all planned. Those that are yours, oh God. You have it all worked out. You have your purposes. For all the trials and difficulties we may go through is all for good. For Lord, you're creating within us a heart sold out for you those oh God that will give you the glory and all the praise that you oh God would flow forth through your church in these days that the light of God would shine more brightly through your vessels in these days we give you praise we give you thanks Thank you for including us in your family. Thank you, Lord, for your patience. Thank you. Come, Holy Spirit. Have your way in each heart and in each life, in each family, Lord. You've been working all the time. You have not left us. You have not forsaken us. But, Lord, you've shown how great is your love and your patience. How great is your love to each and every one of us. Thank you. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill. Fill to overflow. Come. Take our praise. Take our songs this morning. May we flow with your Spirit. May we go where your wind blows us. May we go wherever you want us to go this morning. We want to know you more. We want to walk with you. We want to be led by your eye. We want to go where you want to take us. Whatever it means for each and every one of us, Lord. Your will, your purpose. I don't know what's best for me, but you do. Your will be done, oh God. But Lord, may we simply trust you through it all. I give you praise. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you.
Petitions known, I can go into the holy of holies, and although I'm just a common man, because of God's redemption plan, I can boldly approach the throne once again. I can go into the holy. Petitions know I can go into the holy of holies, and although I'm just a common man, because of God's redemption plan, I can boldly approach the throne because of God's redemption. Land. I can boldly approach the throne. And who? Who can stop a child, a son? from being in his own home, from going to where we have come from, who can separate us? Who, wrote Paul, I'm persuaded that no one can separate us. Neither death, nor life, whatever might come to us in life, whatever circumstances might be happening in our life, around our life, nor angels, not the angels of God, they're not there to stop us. They're there to help us, to minister to us. No, the angels, the fallen ones, who with their voices and shouts and condemnations and fears try to stop us from coming into the place we have a rightful place to be. The depths of His love. Who can separate us? principalities yes the powers that be can place our bodies in shackles but they cannot stop our soul and our spirit and our mind from being in Christ for he opened once with his sacrifice the door. Sickness can't separate us. Depressions can't separate us. A virus can't separate us. Fears can't separate us. We can separate ourselves if we want. We can exclude ourselves if we want. We can believe the lies the father of lies that says we are not worthy we cannot but nor principalities nor power nor things present at the time of Paul's writing of this epistle nor things to come which means everything that has been done, that has been made, that has been invented, that will be invented till the end of time. Nothing that will ever be made, nothing that ever would happen 
will be able to separate us. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. I didn't know there was a creature named height and a creature named depth. But it says neither height nor death nor any other creature will be able or shall be able to separate us from that place of love perpetual, of love unbound, of love eternal of our heavenly abode our heavenly home which is in Christ in Jesus our Savior so I declare in this time and age with all its invention with all the things the enemy has made to try to separate us. I declare that nothing can separate his people, his church. Nothing. They can separate us. And they have many times in history. They can separate us from a place of worship. They can impede us from gathering together. But they can't, never have been able to, never will be able to stop us from crossing over to the other side. Nothing. All we have to do is just close our spiritual eyes. Oh, yes, they can try to keep our eyes open with clamps like they have when they tortured Christians. But my eyes, which have seen the glory, nothing, nothing. Because I can come into the Holy of Holies. I can kneel and make my petitions known. I can go into the Holy of Holies. And although I'm just common man because of God's redemption plan I can boldly approach the throne now I can go through the veil that was broken I can kneel and make my petitions known I can go into the Holy of Holies. And although I'm just a common man, because of God's redemption plan, I can boldly approach the throne. Yes, I can go into the Holy of Holies. I can kneel Make my petitions known. I can go into the holy of holies, and although I'm just a common man, because of God's redemption plan, I can boldly approach the throne. I can go into the holy. I can go into the hole, the hole, and 
I kneel my heart and my soul before you. You see the petition that weigh heavenly on my heart. Petitions not for myself. For thy people, O oh Lord. For those that are yet to be born. For those prisoners. For those slaves. the ruling Pharaoh to let your people go. Command the destroyer to cease. Command as you did your angel over Jerusalem. Would you judge David? And set that scourge command, I pray. That that sword that is still raised in judgment over this nation and the nation ruled by evil, the nations of the world under the control. Cause that angel, I pray, to look down upon your Jerusalem and the inhabitants of Jerusalem scattered throughout this earth. And let the sword be placed again in its scabbard. That the arrows stop. And let your light begin to shine in healing in renewal and let the new day that you have provided for this coming time let it begin let your sun 
of righteousness. Shine. And let the shadows be dispersed. Let the heavy fog of gloom be lifted from the earth. Say the word and it shall be for nothing can stop the light of your love, compassion, grace and mercy to shine. your light to rise upon the earth. Let it be. Let it begin. Let it begin in the time that we call Christmas the gift of God's love. Let it be when the signs are again in the heavens. Let at that time the new beginning arrive with healing in your wings. I lay that petition at the altar and throne of grace that we might obtain mercy for we are your people. We are nothing, we are but common men of no social, political power. We are just children gathered around the throne of grace awaiting eagerly as children do at Christmas time to see what you have prepared for us what has been closed and wrapped up until that time of revelation. We eagerly await to see your plan. We eagerly await to see the old fade the new become reality and after the long nights the dark nights full of fears forebodings questions of the future Jesus appeared unto them and said Peace. It is I. Let not your heart be troubled.
And the sounds I heard was, it is well. All is well It is well It is well All is well Submerge, O oh Lord, your church and your people in all the world deep beneath the stormy billows of the surface. And submerge us. Beneath those stormy waves and winds and lightnings. That cannot penetrate. Beneath the waves. There where all is calm. There where all is peace. There where the evil one cannot reach, for it's beyond his reach. Immerse us in that peace of the depths of the oceans of your love. Yesterday all morning I had a Zoom meeting with the leaders of young people in several places in the world. And uh, <clears throat> there was a, a word I shared with them about the young people and, and their work as leaders. But I want to share with you a, a, a portion actually a word from God that was given in December nine years ago. A young man was under the power and in a trance. The Lord began to speak through him. And I'd like to expand that. I didn't do that yesterday. And it says, there will be new inventions in the world and there will be humans who are not human walking on the streets. Be careful in a short time, a place of inventions will be opened where things that have already been created will be opened and people will be able to see them and bring them back here earth and from the place of light and from the place of darkness these inventions will be the darkness will make inventions to seek out those of the light so they can chase harass persecute them and those of the light will find inventions that will make and help them to escape a place will be opened where there is everything that has already been created, where they can go and take it. Look closely into the eyes of those who make those inventions, because you will know from where it was taken from. These inventions will seem to be a service unto men. But it will be reversed, and that service will become a bondage. 
a bondage of man to that service. You can already see it in those networks I have spoken of you before. And what he spoke before was the month before that, in November 2011, when he said networks. Be careful with social networks because they are real nets that do not stop catching. This is why men gave it its name, a net. What they want is to capture their attention and drag them towards the shores so they cannot remain in deep places. Be careful. What is watched on television, heard on the radio, and what you read. May that helpful service or program not make you a slave. In times that are coming, all things will be moved, stopped, retained, or brought to the ground through prayer. Today, I would like to highlight and expand on parts of these words, those fishnets which capture people and take them from the deep places to the shallows of the shore. It's interesting that <clears throat> the symbol for Christianity has always been a fish, also known as the ichthys which comes from the ancient Greek word for fish, is an acronym. Jesus in the parable of the dragnet referred to fish as being people, both evil and good, that would be harvested in the end times. Fish that are in the depths grow to be big. These are the prizes that the fishermen seek. They're not the minnows that are in the shallow waters. The fisherman seeks those that are in the deep waters. Those are the prizes. But the fish are big in the deep waters because there they have the space, the freedom, the food, the oxygen, the nutrients they live, they need to live and thrive. They are not creatures that belong in the shallows, nor outside of the water, for that is not their world. Outside the water, they would suffocate quickly. For you see, fish <clears throat> don't use lungs like we do. They use gills that can breathe, receive oxygen, under the water. That oxygen that's dissolved in the water is absorbed by blood vessels in the gills. But as soon as the fish comes out of the water, those blood vessels collapse and the gills collapse and they begin to suffocate because they can no longer absorb oxygen. In the same way, the life in us is suffocated when we are not in him. Jesus said, we are in the world, but we're not of this world. Perhaps we're like the mermaids or the mermaid man in the fictional character for those that Perhaps have not heard it or they're not from the States. There's an animated television series called SpongeBob. And in that there's a mermaid man. We've heard of the mermaid. That's a Greek mythological water spirit. That's part fish and part men. They can be in both worlds. That thought came to me because 
We are in the world and yet we're not a part of the world. Actually, there is a merle male, the equivalent, male equivalent of the mermaid. So it was a familiar figure in folklore and heraldry. heraldry. In all the traditions about the sightings of mermen are less common than the mermaids. It's generally assumed to coexist and be necessary along with the mermaids to exist. We know, and I mentioned in an online message a while back, about the mermaids that would sing and draw men to kill them. Maybe the mermen are supposed to save men and not destroy them. There's a scripture, Jesus says, I'll make you fishers of men anyway, whatever. Whatever kind of fishmen we are that are in a world and yet don't belong to that world. This world of which we are not a part and yet we are in. We cannot survive if we are only in this world. That's why I use the illustration of the merman which can exist in both worlds, in the water and in the air world. And we, as God's children, will begin to suffocate if we stay too long in the world that we're in or we don't belong to, if we don't return to those places where we can breathe life, we need to return constantly to those deep waters to survive and being fed. For, because that is our world and that will be our eternal world when we leave this world. In Romans chapter 11, <clears throat> 33, it talks to about us about the, the deep places, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. In Ephesians 3.18, Paul tells us about the depths that have of love, that have a fourth dimension that doesn't exist here on earth, so it means it's another world, like the world of the ocean, the world of the water. Because it says the measurements in that different world are four, Height, depth, length, and breadth, whatever that is, is a different world, different dimension. And to know the love of Christ, with, which passes all knowledge, which is in the world. <clears throat> that there you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And when we're in the deep waters, of which the fishermen enemies try to make us come into their nets and draw us away from that place, place of life and take us to the place of suffocation of our life, inner life. Those creatures of the depth, when they come to the surface, they cannot see the world because to see the world you have to go to the shallows. In the deep parts of the ocean, when you come up, all you see is heaven, all you see is sky, all you see is light, all you see is sun. And if you come up when the sun has gone over the horizon, you will see the stars that remind you as Abraham of God's promises. But when you come to the shore, the shallow places, that's when you begin to see the things of the world. The buildings, the cities, men that belong only in this world. And if you stay too long, or if you're caught in a net, there you begin to suffocate, suck out the oxygen of spiritual life. And we begin to wilt and die. Jesus in the parable of the sower said that to that little tender plant 
the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of the riches of this world, and the lusts of other things in this world choke, suffocate, suck out the life of that little plant, of that seed that tried to grow, which is his word. Those nets <clears throat> are of the evil one, designed, even though so many things, lovely apps and pro programs, they seem to be given to us for free because they love us, because they want to do a service to humanity. But far from that, they're designed to capture and drag you away from the source of true life. The nets of media are addictive due to the effect that it has upon the brain. Media, gaming, social media is addictive both psychologically and physically. They made a study in Harvard University. That being on social networking, Facebook, YouTube, video gaming, it lights up the same part of the brain that lights up when you're taking an addictive drug. Social media is so addictive because it plays on one of the most fundamental aspects of what it means to be a human. A need for social connection to others. People post and wait for others to reply. And why? Because they lack that interaction of a family, of a loving and nurturing of a father, of a mother. And today's battlefield is inside of man, a battle to control men's hearts, control men's minds through the nets of media and social media. That attraction, like I said, fills the void of the family. Youth longing for love and belonging to a tribe and be able to, to be better than his other tribe members, to separate himself from the crowd and be special. All Things come from God. The devil is not an inventor. He is a copier. Don't wish to offend any Chinese, but for a long time, and even today a little bit too, they're well known for just copying. And uh, all these things were given by God, that place of inventions, is given by God. It's all been created already. And you can, that can be used for good of mankind or for evil. And it has been used and it is being used. But we can use it for good. We can use it also as weapons against evil. We can use radio, television, internet. We can use it all. In Psalm 1834, it says, I remember this scripture since I was a young man in, in seminary in Argentina, with my father. It says, <clears throat> he teaches my hands to war so that a bow, bow of steel is broken by my arms. He teaches my arms, my hands to war. I remember many years ago, in that seminary, in Poppy, there came a time of warfare, spiritual warfare. And we would sing and uh, we would hear and he would use that scripture that he taught our hands to war. And another one is Psalm 144 that I'll mention in a second. And we didn't really know what it meant. And so I remember we would use our hands and maybe you've still seen this in Argentina there will probably be a lot of people that will recognize this when they hear this. They'll use their hands, put their hand as a fist and begin to hammer on their palm as they pray, as they battle, walk around doing this. 
Maybe that's what teaches my hands to make war. And uh, David repeated this again in Psalm 144, 1. It says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. And so at that same time, I used to fight and use my fingers in playing the organ for my father in the meetings and in the, in the conferences we had at that time. And I said, well, I'm battling with my fingers. As they pounded their hands, I would battle with my fingers. But now that scripture makes so much more sense. He makes my hands to war and my fingers to fight. That's what you do on a keyboard. Your fingers can be fighting a battle. They used to say the pen is mightier than the sword. But so is the keyboard. If used to send forth rays of light into the world. To battle against darkness. And the same thing with audio messages. Video services. It can all be used as a way of fighting with your fingers and with your hands. Words are so powerful if they have light, as we well know when we read God's word. But words depends on who uses them. The enemy, the dark army, of the devil uses words to try to bring darkness into man's souls. They use it as weapons in education for our children, our young people. They use it in the government for making laws and deceitful declarations, in the media with brainwashing, social media, news media, to indoctrinate, to shape man's way of thinking. To agitate and provoke men into riots, to hate, to discrimination. The power of words to do evil and to do good. James spoke about this, about the tongue that is a flame that destroys of when it comes from hell itself. And those words lead people to fear to panic, to quake for their lives. And they use the words strengthened by the word virus, COVID, to control people's actions, to enclose them, to empower themselves to rule over them, to shape their thoughts, their actions, to limit, to take away, if it's possible, the very freedom that we are guaranteed in our Constitution. Their weapons are so powerful, but are not our weapons as powerful or more powerful when they're used by the spirit that created that invention? He knows all the power that's available in those inventions and those that yet to come. We should not fear them. We should know to discern. And he who wrote that code already invented, that put it in man's minds to write, knows the back doors, knows the heavenly hacks of how to use that service for good. One of our powerful weapons are the one the devil uses. Words, enticement against us. But not just our words, which are powerless. But God's words, which are quick and powerful. As Hebrews 4.12 says, sharper than any two-edged sword. Referring to the weapons of that time. The most powerful sword that could be had at that time. With the best forged steel. 
that a man could find that could split a hair in the air. Any two-edged sword cannot compare to the word of God. The sharpness, quick, powerful, piercing, even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit. Not the greatest medical scientist in the world knows where the spirit begins and the soul continues. It is all morphed together. In a maze of synapses somewhere in the brain. No one can discern where those emotions are born, where the spirit is born. And yet it says he can divide. That's how sharp. Between the soul and the spirit. We don't know one from the other. We can be in the spirit one moment and be in the emotions the next. We can't discern the difference. And the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Those are weapons more powerful than the enemy's weapons. To be able to discern by his Holy Spirit that's within us. That gives us the discernment into people's hearts and their thoughts and the intents of their hearts. So when that spirit from those depths are in you, you can walk up to whoever the spirit sends you to and discern their very thoughts, their very intentions. Not only what they ate for breakfast. And we'll see a lot of this in this new day. As God begins to deploy his army with these weapons of heaven. Another powerful weapon that I know that we know. But I don't think we actually realize the power of prayer. Let me read again to you that part where he said. That there was coming a time that, just give me a second here. The times are coming when all things will be moved through prayer. All things will be stopped through prayer. All things would be retained so they're not lost through prayer. All things will be brought to the ground through prayer. I don't think we realize the powerful weapons that we use like the Lord's Prayer sometimes as just words. But when under The control of the Holy Spirit that knows the secret of that weapon and when, where are those buttons that you must touch to make that from a conventional weapon of one little bullet to a flamethrower or a bazooka. You know... The power of prayer. No wonder Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Can't be compared to anything. They're powerful. Mighty. Through God. To pull down strongholds. Pharaoh, let your people go. That wasn't just a petition. That was an order. 
and to disobey that order brought chaos to his kingdom. Chaos to his very home and his family. Ten times he chose to disobey that order. And ten times heaven rained down upon them plagues until that most powerful leader of the most powerful nation in the world, Egypt, was brought to their knees as the Pharaoh was left without a dynasty as his firstborn son died on the night of the Passover. He cut, cut off his power. It would not continue on the earth. The dynasty would stop and another pharaoh would come to Egypt. The power to pull down strongholds Oh, sometimes we pray as if we thought it was a BB gun. The power of prayer. Because we doubt its power. That they're mighty to cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, whether it be men or demons, or demons walking on the earth as men. This called my attention. And I remembered the giants were one of those occasions. Jesus on another occasion said to people, you are devils. Now we know from the beginning We have heard of people that were filled with a demon and spoke like a demon and walked like a demon. If it walks like one, quacks like one, it is one. And it seems to be a lot of people that we say, how can a person be this way? It looks like, it seems like, it quacks like, it squats like a duck, it's a duck. Sounds like a devil. It is a devil. Of course. Now they know better than to appear like a giant, don't they? They'd be easily recognized. So they're humans walking amongst us. Casting down imaginations. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Those that hate God and even the knowledge, they want to get rid of the knowledge of God, get rid of people's religion that they cling to, as our president once said. Those that exalt themselves, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Those are the weapons of our warfare. And Jesus said, chapter 18, verse 18, Truly I say unto you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I know we've heard it, we know the doctrine about it. But it is a reality. Do we fear to press that button? To pull that trigger? Do we think it's a BB gun? Do we believe actually what Jesus said to his disciples? What you bind on earth shall be bound on heaven. Have you ever done that? I have. And I was so nervous and shaky. I thought it was going to explode in my face. I didn't know it was real. And yet, it is. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Remember what that word said? 
Times that are coming, all things will be moved, stopped, retained, and brought to the ground through prayer. Lord, release that prayer to this generation. Release the faith in the prayer of resurrection. Release the faith upon this generation to the possibilities that are beyond our grasp. Yes, so great is the power of prayer, but do we believe that? Or do we believe the words of the deceit of the enemy that says prayer is powerless? Just something we do in church to make us happy. But prayer, if we believe the enemy's lies, it loses its power. If there's doubt, it doesn't operate. You must believe, Jesus said. If you don't believe, it doesn't happen. Truly I say unto you, Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, whoever shall say to this mountain, be you removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. We've prayed for many things. But so many times our prayer sounds like a request. Sounds like, if it's possible, I know it probably won't happen. But I would like this to happen. I don't know if it'll happen or not. There you go. You wet your gum, gum powder. If you believe and don't doubt in your heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he said. Oh, Lord, please do not bequeath the prayer of the last generation to the future generation. Teach them to pray. We've learned so many things about prayer. and We've exercised them. We've seen results. But I think there's so much more. I think that a weapon, a prayer that God has given the world... We saw Jesus use it. And we said, oh my God. Yes, that's exactly who he was. My God. We've seen the things that he did. We said, oh yeah, of course, because he's God. He said, come on, you guys. Greater things than I have done, you will do. Oh, come on. You really believe that? I don't think I believe that. If not, I'd probably pray differently. I'd probably expect differently. But he has provided this weapon. Even though the enemy says to us like he does to David. What's that stick in your hand? What's that stone in your hand? Oh, it's just a stone, I guess. God said, it's a radar directed Missile inside of that stone. Just put it in your sling. Throw it anyway. It, throw it backwards if you want to do it. Boom. You come to me with sticks and stones. He says, no, I come to you. In the name of the Lord God of heaven. The almighty. Your puny prayer. You think you can... Destroy all I've done and tried to do here in your world, in your country, and everything else, in your life, and your family. With that little puny prayer that you can barely believe yourself. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? What's in our hand is a powerful weapon in the hands of God. If we only believe. There's another factor that renders prayer useless. 
makes it lose its power, and that's if there's sin, unforgiven sin. The enemy will tempt us and entice us in so many ways. Through words, through the internet, through the media. To try to entice us to sin in our thoughts or in our actions or in our intents. Because when we do, immediately the weapon of prayer is shunted. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So prayer cannot leave the barrel if there's iniquity. In John 9, 31, Now we know that God does not hear sinners. So we need the constant cleansing of the blood for our prayer to be effective. James says in James 5.16, The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We don't have righteousness. Christ has righteousness. And his blood that forgives our sin gives us his righteousness. So we need to have an active altar, not an altar we go once a year or every step year. We need an active altar where the blood is shed and where we are washed. Paul said there is a warfare and today the biggest battle, I think, is being fought right here in our land. This is where the main battle is, perhaps the Alamo. The outcome of that battle will affect the world. We are the children of light. Our enemy is darkness. And light will, has, and will forever triumph over darkness. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Darkness has never prevailed against light. And right now the light is shining in our nation, uncovering that which is hidden, bringing things to light that have been in darkness, exposing them. All that the enemies were planning in secret, this new world order is no longer a secret. The whole world is talking about it. The enemy was so hidden, infiltrated, disguised as our friend. And now we see the monsters they are. We see the tech is not our friends. We see the media is not our friend. Now they're being discovered. They will be now angry. Their attacks unbridled. This covert war that has been going on in the world, the whole world has been going, been infiltrated little by little in every home, neighborhood, city, province, and nation. And this war has not been waged with tanks or soldiers or aircraft. It's too obvious. People get scared. It wakes up the population. It hinders the takeover. Since Eden... The enemy is battled against God's people. And now again the battle rages between light, darkness, truth and lies, deceit and honesty. To try to trick us. Be scammed into willingly giving up. No. God's people never give up to the devil. Anyone agree with that? We have a king. His name is Jesus. We live in a kingdom and it's not of this earth. So let us break out of those nets that are dragging us away from our home in the depths of his love, his truth, his light. And let us fight the good battle of faith without doubting. Let us pray. 
Without doubting, let us declare his word and his promises. For his promises are yea and amen, which means it will happen. Even though you must wait for it. But it will be. So let us turn our eyes away from the nets. Away from what the enemy wants us to see. I don't want to look at what he wants me to look at. I want to look at what he wants me to look at. And what he wants me to look at is truth. Not what my eyes see in this world. The truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the light. I am the way. I don't want to look at the deceiver. I want to look at the one that set me free from deceit and sin and delivered me. I want to turn my eyes upon Jesus. I'd like us to sing that as we close. Ed, thank you. We know who this world belongs to and who will reign supreme and that is Christ Jesus the light that triumphed over death shamed his enemies and in dying provided for us the precious blood the weapons that are not carnal May the Lord cause us to break free. If you are tied in those nets, if your life, your spiritual life is suffocating because of breathing the air the devil pumps into the shores, that toxic air, that carbon filled dioxide air that only causes us to go to sleep. Pump there on the shore and leave us just flailing like a flapping fish when we should be gracefully moving through the oceans. Break free. May the Lord set you free. May he set free this generation from the nets. May he take you to the depths where there's truth, where there's light, where there's life, where the weapons are great, where we can be in this world without becoming the world, where you can walk on the streets without the, walk, the streets walking in you, where you are free in a world of prisoners for we are free because he set us free remain free for he has made us free it is our right in the constitution of heaven and sealed by the cross freedom God's children cannot be taken prisoners so do not give yourself up as prisoners. Break free. For whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. The church of God in all the world. Arise and be free. Jerusalem, rise up. Shake off the dust. Shake off the shackles. Shake off the chains off your neck. For you are free. Hallelujah. So church, I know there's so many distractions around us. It used to be you had to buy a newspaper to see what happened yesterday. Today, every moment, they're showing you what the world is. And everything you read, you see, and they cause you to read, whether it's true or not, it suffocates you inside. You can get up so happy 
refreshed from dreaming of being in heaven with your Savior. The message comes to the phone. You read the news. And suddenly, the joy is sucked. Or a text, or an email, or a pink slip. You're fired! <laughs> Knocks the wind out of your sails. We are free. Born free. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't let the life be sucked out of you. Let the life be blown into you by the breath of the life giver. And as you place your eyes upon Jesus, the things of this world will begin to fade. The power of the inventions used for evil will lose their power to hold you, to frighten you. The news of the outbreak, ten times worse, will be like some distant bell. things of earth will grow strangely dim not disappear because we still are in the world we're part of the world but we're not of the world we're God's God's children God's creation walking on earth and when they've all been identified, they'll only be left on earth, God's progeny and devils. And when that time comes, all the wheat will be gathered and all the devil's seed, the tares, Jesus said will be sent to the fire which was created for the devil and his angels Revelation says as for me does that mean we escape from realities no it means we don't place our eyes our attention upon it we don't let it affect us we allow the spirit to surround us as the song we sing with a firewall we can see what's happening but it's not getting into us because we're protected and it's all like through a mist through a fog that doesn't take away our peace that doesn't worry us because we know who we are and who is with us in the light of his glory and grace. Can you stand with me in benediction? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange. Dear, in the light of his glory and grace church turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the thing of her will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace 
Lord, turn my eyes upon you, Jesus, so I can look full in your wonderful face, so that the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Breathe upon me, breath of God. Breathe upon me, Spirit of the Lord. Lord, I pray that that breath of the depths of your world, of your presence, may the air of heaven Breathe it upon our souls. Lord, because the things that the enemy distracts us to look at, they suck out that breath of life and we begin to suffocate. Spirit of God, breathe. Life into our hearts. The air of heaven, of the world we belong to by your salvation. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Breathe upon your people here in Georgia. In the United States, wherever in the world your people might be, those that are weak, whose life is being sucked out by what's happening around them, by the fears. Lord, I pray, breathe upon your church. In every nation, tribe, and language, so be it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.